to it. I'm uh, Leslie Francis from the Division of Medical Ethics and Humanities and the Law School and the Philosophy Department here at the U. And I'm delighted both at the number of people who are here, but even more importantly, to have the privilege of moderating this session on um, the neuroscience of addiction, its effects on vulnerable populations, and policy implications. We are actually going to start on the medical side of things and then move to the public policy and uh, funding uh, kinds of issues. I held my breath a minute because I suspect it's going to get sadder and sadder as we go along through the panel. Um, so the panelists in the order um, that they're going to speak are first Kristen Keefe, who is Professor of Pharmacology and Toxicology in the College of Pharmacy here at the U. Um, Glenn Hansen, who is Associate Dean in the School of Den Dentistry and Director of Utah's Addiction Center. Um, Janita Emerson, who is the Chief Operating Officer at the 4th Street Clinic. And Patrick Fleming, who's the retired director, but not really retired at all, of Salt Lake County Behavioral Health and a member of the 4th Street Clinic's Quality Improvement uh, Committee. They're each going to talk to you for a few minutes about their piece of the elephant. And then uh, we're going to open it up for Q&A. So without anything more, I'm going to step back and turn the mic over to Kristen. So we actually thought we'd like to start just with a show of hands to get a sense of who's in the audience. So how many people are students in health sciences? Okay, and then faculty or in health sciences? And clinicians, practitioners in areas related to drug abuse and addiction, same, okay. And then any, are there um, maybe students not in the health sciences in social work, any of those disciplines? from College of Social and Behavioral Sciences? Okay. Any populations we left out? Community members? People just from the community of inter interest in? Okay. All right, so um, I'm gonna start with a little bit of the background. My degree is in behavioral neuroscience and I'm a professor in pharmacology and toxicology. My laboratory is interested in changes in neural circuitry associated with the changes that might underlie the plastic changes in the brain contributing to a transition from drug abuse to drug addiction phenotype. And in general, my laboratory is interested in brain circuitry that's involved in behavioral selection in organisms and how organisms make decisions about different behaviors. And so I think the perspective that I bring to this table is as a, a basic neuroscientist and someone who individually has a very firm belief that we are a product of our brains and our behaviors, whether it's an addicted phenotype or not, is really um, a consequence of our brain circuitry and what we bring to the table in terms of how our brain functions. And so it's really widely accepted now that addiction is a disease, right? It is a disease of an essential organ of the body, which is the brain, and it's not really a matter of will. It's not really a matter of choice in most individuals who have transitioned from drug abuse or addiction, but it is truly a disease, and we need to treat it that way, and as, as professionals, we need to, I think, espouse that position very strongly in the public, and we need to also make sure that we're doing the best we can to try and figure out how we address this disease and design better treatments and think also about preventive strategies as our approach. And so um, in keeping with the theme, I was thinking, I mean, we all pick our poison. So it's very difficult for me to sit up here and not go back there and see what's good to eat on that table back there, even though I already ate lunch before I came over. And we all make behavioral choices every day in our lives, whether it's jaywalking, uh, how fast we drive, do we check our phone while we're driving, do we eat things that we shouldn't given our chemistry at our last physician's visit, and so on. And some individuals, for a variety of reasons, will make choices to use substances of abuse and abuse 
uh, substances, whether they're prescription, legal, or Ill illegal um, compounds. And those are just, in my view as a neuroscientist, just normal behavioral choices that we make as organisms for a variety of reasons. And I don't believe that we're really ever necessarily going to get rid of the abuse side of abuse and addiction. I think individuals may always, for a variety of reasons, abuse different substances. And so my, my interest is really kind of what drives those behavioral choices and then when an individual transitions to addiction, a compulsive drug taking and drug seeking phenotype under conditions where it can be aversive to their well-being, they may desire to quit but have a very difficult time, what is it fundamentally that has changed in those brains and how might we undo those changes to allow them to engage in more uh, better choices for themselves. So we're very interested in, I mean, the dopamine system is, as everyone knows, heavily involved in the initial reinforcing properties of drugs, the continuing reinforcing properties of drugs, and maybe uh, some of the decreases in do dopamine signaling in the deficit states that might drive people to continue using drugs. But my laboratory is also very interested in the, in the plastic changes, so how the brain becomes differentially wired in the addicted state and how might we undo that. And I think it's actually a Carrie Glenn's one statement that I heard at, at the opening of the Utah Addiction Center when he talked and when he said that, you know, saying to someone who is an addict, if you loved your family, if you loved your children, if you loved your wife, you would stop using drugs is like saying to a person with Parkinson's disease, if you loved your family, if you loved your spouse, you would stop tremoring. This is a brain that is fundamentally changed and now wired to engage in these behaviors. And I think it's incumbent on us to figure out how to address that change in wiring and what are those features that are now contributing to the drug addicted state. And so I think I would just stop there and let, sorry I took your I line. <laughs> Do we have to sit? No. Oh. <laughs> uh, it's just my habit to wander. Uh, it's difficult for me to sit and talk about this topic. I have uh, worked in the field of uh, drug addiction and its neurobiology for well over 30 years and I've seen a lot happen in that 30 year period. And, and I'm sure Patrick can relate to this. He, he kind of looked at a different piece of that elephant. But I watched the neurobiology and our understanding of why addiction occurs and how drugs of abuse affect the brain and how we treat that. I've watched that evolve. Uh, perhaps during the 1990s, uh, those of you that have been around longer than many uh, may remember we called that the decade of the brain. Remember that? And uh, a lot of money was infused into the National Institutes of Health and into other government programs to help understand why drug abuse and addiction occurs. And we learned a lot. We developed a lot of technology, a lot of methodology from imaging and neurochemistry, uh, electrophysiology. We had Nobel Prize winners who, who started to engage in that because there was money. I mean, Nobel Prize winners are like the rest of us. They follow the money. Uh, but in getting those folks involved in this, we learned a ton about the neurobiology of addiction. And then the question became, what are we going to do with all this information? How are we going to use it? And where are we going to go with it? Now, I could talk about the neurobiology, but I think uh, Dr. Keefe did a wonderful job sort of orienting you to the medical side, the contrast be between decision making, uh, criminal justice, good, bad behavior versus the medical side and, and uh, the neurobiology. And those two aren't necessarily separated. I don't want to give you the impression that there isn't any behavioral consequences or issues that we have to address on that other side. In fact, the two come together and should actually be used together in our development of strategies to, to deal with these people. But having said that, one of the most important things about the neurobiology or the science isn't that we're going to find a cure to this disease. I think we've given up on that. And when I say a cure, I mean a magic pill. 
uh, one medication like with an antibiotic you can give and the disease goes away and this person now becomes normal, happy, gets uh, his or her friends and family back and everything was, was as it was before they uh, started dabbling with these drugs. That just isn't going to happen. But what it does do, it gives us some insight as to where to go, how to predict these people and their risk, and maybe do some prevention to keep it from happening, and also be more effective in treating them. And then maybe, just as important, it gives us power to go to those folks who make decisions for the rest of us, whether it's in the government, uh, whether it's in other institutions, whether it's in education, and help them to understand policy making and what is the most effective way to deal with this population and how to work with them and how to address the problems that uh, are consequences. So just, I'm going to use up my time really quickly, so <laughs> stop me when you want. Uh, I had an opportunity to go back to NIH and uh, I uh, served as the director of one of the divisions there and then I was asked to direct the Institute of the National Institute on Drug Abuse for a couple of years. And during that time I learned an awful lot about policy making and I learned a lot about leveraging, taking information that had been accumulated during that decade of the brain and that has accumulated since and use it to educate. Uh, I went up on uh, Capitol Hill many times to talk to our Congress, uh, talk to the drug czar who's in charge of a lot of the policies that relate to drug abuse and related issues. I met with uh, Patrick Kennedy. I think most of us know who he is used to be a member of the House, uh, but since then is an advocate for mental health, but also drug abuse related issues. Spent three hours one afternoon with him talking about why he can't, why he should not ignore drug abuse stuff when he's trying to advocate for mental health stuff. And the way I did that was neurobiology. I showed the neurobiology of mental health, I showed the neurobiology of drug abuse and how these things superimposed. And this was why there's a 60, 70% co-expression of these problems. Now I'm not saying that my talk with Patrick Kennedy totally changed his attitude and now we have what we call the, the Parity Act, which came as a part of Affordable Care Act. I mean, it's out there and we could spend the whole afternoon discussing what that means and where it's going to eventually take us. But it was a major shift in, in national policy about how do you deal with drug abuse issues and has put it into the medical realm of discussion. It hasn't eliminated it from the criminal justice side, but it's put it into the medical side. So now it is official. The federal government says we got to think about it in the same way as we do cancer, cardiovascular disease, and other kinds of diseases. We also, I also had the opportunity to meet with the drug czar. The drug czar, uh, who at that time uh, was John Walters, an appointee from uh, uh, George Bush, came in with a background of somewhat criminal justice, very much on the DE side of policy, the Drug Enforcement Administration. I had many chances to sit down and talk to him about the neurobiology of addiction. And there was a substantial shift in, in the DEA and their attitude towards criminal justice versus the medical side. And it wasn't just me, it was others who had a chance to sit down and have these same kinds of discussions. And then let me just finish up more locally. When I came back, we had an opportunity to interact with Pat, got to know Pat really well wonderful advocate for issues related to drug abuse. Uh, at one time he was a director of uh, the, uh, the State Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health. Uh, and then he became the Salt Lake County uh, director of a, a comparable agency. 
and we worked together on a number of initiatives lobbied up at the uh, up on campus or up on the Capitol Hill and let me just share quickly one example of what happened here locally this was out in 2007 2006 at that time we were wrestling with a severe methamphetamine problem uh, this state was close to being the most affected state in the country from methamphetamine abuse and addiction. And that's very unusual for Utah. We're usually the best. That is, we have the least of these problems. We certainly have our problems, but we are usually the least. But with this methamphetamine issue, we were amongst the worst, particularly for young uh, mothers. And young mothers were filling our treatment agencies. Thousands of these uh, young women were showing up, and the state didn't know how to deal with this. And so John Huntsman, who was governor at the time, says, we have got to address this issue. And he declared that they were going to spend a couple of million dollars on a task force. Were you on that task force? So uh, Pat and I and a number of other folks, a lot of folks that represented a number of institutions from criminal justice, from education, and then from the services side. And I guess I was the token neurobiologist. Uh, and But that's always fine because people tend to listen to you uh, when you get up and you have an important story to tell. So they gave me a chance to, to spin my, my uh, perspective of uh, methamphetamine abuse. Spent an hour, did a PowerPoint, the whole thing that this is what it looks like on the medical side. Before that, Huntsman wanted to start a campaign. It was called the, the Montana methamphetamine model. It was a shock and awe model. You know, go in and convince all of us that there was a methamphetamine lab next door and that you wanted to watch them like a hawk and we wanted to put all these folks in jail uh, or they would destroy our children and they would cause all kinds of grief and problems. Uh, certainly there's that element but we felt like that really didn't reflect the medical side of this problem. It didn't reflect the biomedical information that we had been gathering. And so I had this chance to present to uh, the Huntsman, uh, Governor Huntsman's people and show them there's a medical side that we need to talk about. And we got Huntsman to go to, I think it was Odyssey House. Was it Odyssey? I think it was Odyssey House. And say, go and talk to these people. Talk to some of these mothers and find out what this really looks like in human beings who are our sisters, our loved ones, our family members, and not an evil drug lord who lives next door trying to kill people with their, uh, with their drugs. And so, somewhat begrudgingly, I think he decided, okay, I'll go and I'll spend 15 minutes. I'll go down to Odyssey House and I'll take a look. He spent the whole afternoon and he engaged with some of these young mothers and he found, he uh, learned their story and he found out what was going on and he came back and he said, hey, we're not doing that Montana meth thing. We're gonna come up with a different strategy. And the strategy, one of the, one of the uh, things that they presented was they had a picture of a baby carriage. It had a bottle. It had a uh, binky pacifier and underneath it says, these are the tools of the methamphetamine addict. And it was an attempt to bring it back home and say, look, these are your loved ones. These are the victims, and we need to deal with these people in a very different way. And so it was more about there is hope. There are medical strategies. We know we are now understanding what this looks like, and we want to work with these people, the people that we love, and help to restore their normal lives. And so the campaign went on for about two years. We visited literally every, every county in the state of Utah, and we had this message. We talked about the biology. We educated them, literally thousands of people through across the state of Utah. And the impact was substantial. The methamphetamine problem didn't go away, but it diminished considerably. The mothers who were being affected by this, that went down. Uh, the national campaign for methamphetamine came and adopted 
our campaign and it became one of the uh, main pieces that was given throughout the, the United States. So bottom line is this knowledge really does have power. It has power in the way individuals perceive the problem. It also has power in the way the policy makers develop programs to deal with this problem. And I think it empowers us that we can move forward, that there is hope, just like that campaign tried to tell uh, the public, there is hope that uh, we can identify these people, prevent it often, and uh, treat those who have been afflicted and hopefully have positive outcomes as a result. Um, hi, I'm. <laughs> it's a tough act to follow. <laughs> um, so I'm Johnny Emerson. I am uh, with Four Street Clinic. And um, for those of you who don't know, Four Street Clinic is uh, a homeless health center uh, here in Salt Lake City. We serve about 5,000 unique patients, and about 25% of those individuals receive mental health and substance abuse services um, through our behavioral health team. But in addition to that, we see a lot of the medical side effects associated with addiction as well. So we see a lot of um, infections, abscesses, hepatitis C, HIV, cellulitis, some of those things that you would anticipate seeing um, in addition to treating the behavioral component of it. Um, and so that was relatively new for me. I came from um, a background of working primarily on the behavioral health side and thinking about how to integrate behavioral health into the primary care medical home kind of model. and. Um, and so it was kind of interesting for me to be able to see that flip side, the medical side of it as well. Because I think so much of when we think about addiction, we really just think about it from that standpoint. But we don't really take into consideration all of the other complicating factors that go along um, with addiction and all the other kind of elements with that. Um, so I was kind of asked today, I think I'm, I'm kicking off the depressing portion of the panel, I was asked to talk about some of the challenges that uh, our population has in, um, in with relationship to addiction. Uh, and so as I kind of thought about that, I kind of came up with four broad categories thinking about uh, access, I think expectations, um, stigma and criminalization and then kind of recovery support and what to do if you do kind of successfully get to a place where you're able to to start um, being more engaged uh, in a way that you want to be. So from an access standpoint, the our patients have a very hard time accessing services and Pat will talk a lot about kind of the underlying causes for this, but um, you know, our existing treatment system really just lacks sufficient infrastructure. We don't have enough treatment facilities. We don't have enough treatment programs. We don't have enough individuals working in addiction um, to be able to meet the demands that we're seeing in the community. Um, it's very difficult to access treatment. So if you can figure out where to get an assessment, the wait list to access care can be anywhere from three to 12 months, depending on the um, level of care that you need. So residential care, you could be waiting 12 to 16 months sometimes. Um, and that would be challenging for any of us, right? And on our best days to be able to maintain our spot on a waiting list, sometimes you have to check in on a weekly basis. I would never be able to remember to do that. So add in the fact that you're also dealing with an addiction issue, you probably have some sort of underlying mental health condition associated with that. Um, you're homeless, you don't have a phone, you're not regularly in one place on an occurring basis. and being able to actually get that treatment spot is really, really challenging. Um, and then there are gaps, I guess, in the system. So we, we do have pretty good access to detox. So I think a lot of people think like, okay, you detox and then you go straight into treatment. There's usually a gap in between that, right? So you'll detox and then you, again, could be waiting for three, 12 months um, to be able to access that uh, higher level of care and um, and that really just leaves individuals open for relapse um, and leaves them vulnerable for for overdoses and other things so I think access is really when I think about challenges that that's what comes to the forefront um, 
expectations. I think these guys touched a lot on that and it also kind of relates into stigma, but I think that we have, we continue to have and, you know, maybe preaching to the choir a little bit, but the general public and policymakers continue to have this expectation, I think, of individuals with addictions that there is going to be this kind of one and done type of um, treatment and solution and you're going to get treatment and then you're going to move on and everything's going to be great and we don't have to worry about it any longer. Um, and those expectations are, they put so much pressure on an individual and they really can, um, they create these high false expectations that can trigger relapse, um, can make it much harder to want to seek services because you, you know that it's going to be more challenging for you. And so I think they actually, they create a, a barrier to accessing care for a lot of individuals. Um, we have this notion that one size of treatment will fit everybody uh, and really we need a treatment system that can be flexible, that can respond more individually to the needs of the population. Um, we see a lot of individuals in the clinic with uh, very complicated histories. They have adverse childhood um, events. They have poor family support, some of those things. And, and the notion that they're going to be able to just go into a treatment system and do what everybody else is able to do is, is really just unrealistic. Um, and I think, and we're kind of getting there, we're starting to see some of these models of harm reduction and syringe exchange um, popping up, but in the notion of kind of being person-centered and not wanting to have this kind of one-size-fits-all model, but really starting to incorporate more um, strategies around harm reduction and understanding that you really do have to be willing to meet the individual where they are at. Um, everyone's going to be at a different place and everyone's going to seek care at a different time um, in their disease and so we really need to have a diverse treatment system that can facilitate capturing as many people at different places as possible and so we are starting to see things like syringe exchange kind of pop up throughout the county and other parts of the state but really looking at these as tools for progressive engagement um, as opposed to, to just the expectation that someone's going to come in and seek help. So a lot of that kind of plays into stigma um, and criminalization. I, there's been a lot of discussion about addiction as a um, health issue and treating it more and more like a health issue, but um, the funding, uh, particularly here in the state, has really been more focused on a criminal justice population and so we see these expansions in treatment we have seen expansions in funding for treatment in the state over the last five years but they have been really targeted at individuals who are involved with the criminal justice system and that really sets it up so that the front door um, to treatment is through an arrest and we do really need to start shifting the funding and kind of how we think about that to make it easier to access treatment without getting arrested first and then once you're able, if you're able to get through all of that, um, the recovery support and the long-term care, the aftercare, access to things like affordable housing, supportive employment, things and tools that we know can help sustain an individual in recovery and help them continue to transition uh, out of homelessness and, um, and being more productive and engaged in their own life. So I'll just maybe close with a story about a, a patient that we've had uh, in clinic. So he's a young man, he's just a couple years younger than I am, and again he has, I think he just really represents kind of the challenges that the homeless population is facing on a regular basis, but a very complicated history, you know, adverse childhood events, bad family support, poor coping skills. Um, he has underlying mental health issues and those are really what um, spurred his entry into homelessness. He's not able to hold a job um, and he was exposed to drugs. Um, being homeless, he was a little bit resistant to seeking care for mental health. I think a lot of that kind of gets into the stigma and what have you. And so he uses drugs um, to kind of help treat his mental illness. Um, and over time that has developed into an addiction. So he's been a patient of ours since 2015. We see him primarily for crisis, um, some behavioral health when we can get him to come in. Uh, over the last course of the end of the summer, we kind of saw 
him escalate and uh, he's been in he was in multiple times you know highly intoxicated we had a couple of uh, instances where we were concerned about overdose um, and him being in the clinic we were able to get him into detox which we were you know is a, not an easy thing to do um, and once he got out of detox then he had that gap um, before he was able to access care and unfortunately he hasn't been back into the clinic this summer uh, since the end of the summer um, we hope that he, we kind of hope he got caught up in Operation Rio Grande and maybe he got a treatment bed out of that um, but I think that's just he's a it that is very much what our clinicians see on a day-to-day -day basis so sorry to be the downer <laughs> thanks. thanks it's nice to be here uh, I'm a graduate of this university and I always love coming back here. Um, we, we did poll, when I was state director, uh, we were trying to fight this tidal wave of, of a negative attitude about addiction. It's a moral failing. And I have to say the University of Utah, Glenn and Dr. Keefe, the work that's being done up here and the professionals that are being produced by this university is what's really helped us turn the corner. Really believe Utah was one of the first states that uh, because of the, we, you know, you got to find a spot and when, when there's a soft spot, you got to touch it and make that. And that, that thing that happened with Governor Huntsman and having him come out and advocate for us was the key. And in a lot of ways, you know, you could say to yourself, well, you took advantage of these young, vulnerable women and you did that thing. You, we couldn't get in the door to talk to any of the policymakers about funding for addiction. We couldn't. Until this happened, and all of a sudden, they saw these young women that looked just like their daughters. And we had them testify before the, the committee, and the committee would sit there with their mouths open. If I would get up there and talk to them, they'd be sleeping, playing with their iPhones. These young women got up and told their story, and it was powerful. It was really powerful. So I want to talk about three things. I want to talk about, about the coverage system in the United States, the history of that, um, kind of where we are now, and hopefully a vision for the future. So <clears throat> as John Eda was saying, it's so interesting, is that there's the, all this lack of treatment resources um, in Utah and this wait for all these beds. Primarily, that is on the public side. The United States has a lot of money that we put into public treatment systems, okay? Not through insurance, public treatment systems. Why is that? Because up until the Affordable Care Act happened, most Americans had no access to health insurance. And in those health insurance plans that they did have access to, behavioral health benefits were generally not covered. So what winds up happening? If somebody gets an addiction, they wind up at the emergency department at the University of Utah, which is going to be, for that stay, $1,500 just to go in there for that, for that four or five hour stay. They don't have any insurance. Where does the cost go? And everybody in this room, either your tax dollars or your insurance uh, premiums are going to go up. So we weren't doing anything uh, with these costs. These costs were not going away. They were getting absorbed and spread out. Every other developed country in the world has some form of comprehensive universal coverage. We sort of are climbing there. We're suffering a bit of a setback right now, and I'm not going to get into the politics of this. I think you all know what I'm talking about. There's a big assault on this. I do believe because of what's happened in the United States, we will rebound from the current, and I'll say it, the current administration. I don't work for anybody anymore, so I can kind of say what I want. <laughs> um, we will get through this. So what's happened is the public has had to come forward, and in Utah, the counties have been given the responsibility to provide the public behavioral health services. So that is prevention services, addictions treatment services, and mental health services. And so that's a public responsibility in Utah. So when we talk about all these beds, as Johnita did, those are basically the public beds that are out there. And there's such a demand for those services and other outpatient, intensive outpatient, other types of services that we just don't have enough resources. And why is that? Is because we, we are not covering the vulnerable populations. So I have a, a, a chart here, and I'm not going to um, go through it. We're going to try to get it on the website. But I would encourage you all to go out and look at this. So this is the coverage scheme for insurance, Medicare, Medicaid 
in the current expansion efforts in Utah to get these populations covered. This looks really confusing, but it's not. It's very simple to understand. But go out and look at this. We have a major hole right now in the coverage thing. This area, I know you can't really see it too well, but right here there's this big white hole. There are so many people that are, are at Johnny Dis Clinic and they are caught up in Operation Rio Grande that basically still do not have coverage because Utah has not done the Medicaid expansion yet. All right, there's going to be a ballot initiative next year. We are going to go to the people. We're going to go to the people with saying to the citizens of Utah, do you want to do the Medicaid expansion? And the polling we have right now is showing us that we'll actually, we'll actually win that. And here's the reason why. The money that the legislature is spending right now in Operation Rio Grande, they're spending state and county general funds on that. That money is enough to make the Medicaid match to get the 90% federal dollars that come in. It's so there's no reason not to do this. It's just that it's pure pol politics on this. So the Affordable Care Act is really, really important because it, it covers behavioral health. It's one of the 10 essential benefits in there, and it covers behavioral health. Very, very critical. Because if we don't pay for it through some kind of a Medicaid or insurance scheme, we're going to be paying for it anyway. In jail beds, emergency department, we're going to be paying for it. So you as people who are educated, when you're talking to your neighbors and your family, that legislator you talk to, don't, when they start saying, oh, this doesn't work and everything, just say to them, um, yeah, it does. Treatment does work. We see people all the time that recover and get their lives back together. So what I would say, especially the students that are here, don't back down on this. This is really, really important. You get a chance to talk to Senator Lee, Senator Hatch, Congressman Stewart, any of them, you got to make the point that this, because this primarily is right now in the federal uh, ballpark. I mean, it really is. In Utah, we'll do, we'll do our own thing here. So the, the other part of this I want to talk about is the future and the hope. We need more people, and the University of Utah is going to provide us with a lot of them, that get involved in the field of addictions and mental health services. And there's a variety of ways you can do it. Treatment, working at treatment agencies or providing care is really, really important. I came up through the administrative side of it, and I think that's really important too because that's where you really do make policy changes. But don't shy away from this. If you're looking for a field to get involved in, this is fascinating. It's just, it, it's been the most fascinating thing that I've been involved in. And you can really make a difference and you can save, save lives every day. And people will come up to you and they will say, my daughter or my son is now back with me. They really have turned the, the, the corner and they're doing really, really well. And it's because we got them into treatment. So the future now is this. I hope in the future, there are a lot of people that are at, the, at John Edith's clinic who never got any primary care at all. But if they did get primary care, their primary care providers never talk to them about addiction, or talk to them about mental health services. They, in other words, they were not caught early and they were not screened. So the future is this, where I've got, so this is my, this is my 15 year old daughter now, okay? <laughs> or no, she's younger than that. 12 year old daughter, and she's been a great student. Wonderful. All of a sudden, her grades are starting to slip. And my wife and I are really worried. We're really, really worried. So. We see her hanging around with these different kids. Grades are slipping. Could smell she's been smoking cigarettes. We're really worried. So what happens? We try to talk to her. She won't talk to us. So we take her in to a pediatrician. She still has a relationship with the pediatrician. We say to the pediatrician, we're a little bit concerned about this. The pediatrician is trained in intervention. They understand what they do. Mom and dad leave the room. And the pediatrician talks to Johnita and asks her some questions. And she's going to be sort of honest with him because she's known him her whole life. And he says, hey, how about if we do this? I'm going to give you a prescription, just like if you give a prescription for anything else. Give you a prescription, and we'll get you to go see somebody, and we'll see if we can help you a little bit. She says, okay, I'll do it. Mom and dad are very supportive of this idea. We drive her there, you know, get her there. That's the kind of screening and intervention that has to happen. And if we can intervene early, she will be okay, like she is now. 
So that's, that's kind of what I see the future is. So again, three things. Understand the coverage thing. This is so important for you all to understand how this works, and it's not that hard. Second thing is support the Affordable Care Act. Third thing is, is the future is get involved and try to really make a difference because I think we really can and we can get through the, the, the terrible times we're in now. So I want to thank uh, all the panelists. I can't um, resist um, observing that there are really enormous vicious cycles in all of this. Uh, just to take one example, if you've had a member of your immediate family convicted of a drug offense, even to get treatment, you no longer qualify for federally subsidized housing. So think about cycles, okay? So it's audience time. Go for it. Questions? We've got about 15 minutes. Peggy, I know we can always count on you. <laughs> So, so I'll just repeat the question quickly in case people didn't uh, hear and we've got a recording. Um, two parts, what do we know historically before the Harrison Act, Act and what do we know um, about Portugal that might just be models or informative? Or informative. Well, I, I tell you this, uh, a side note, um, the percentage So um, just a side note that uh, rates of use didn't change before and after the act and Portugal has reported sign it's, it shifted resources to treatment rather than criminalization and it has reported reduced rates. But now we'll turn it over to the Well, audience. I was going to say that just on, uh, not so much about the Harrison Act, but I know that the, one of the uh, major causes of, um, of opioid uh, use in the United States was post-Civil War. You had so many people uh, when we first started to, to use opioids for treatment, and um, there were a lot of, of uh, civil war, especially the northern soldiers that were addicted. And they came back and they lived. Remember this now? They you know they were they were 19, 1865. They were 25 years old. You know, well they lived through the through the 1890s and early 1900s, and so you had this big group of people that were addicted um, at that point. Um, the uh, thing in Portugal I think is really interesting. Hmm? Oh yeah, yeah. It's payment. Yeah, it's pain management exactly. Um, and so in Portugal, it's kind of interesting because I think in a lot of ways we're trying to do a little bit of this in Utah. Um, you know, the criminal justice system is so interesting with drug courts, and you've all heard about those things. Um, drug, all drug courts are there. Nothing magical there. It, it's just a judge dressed in a black gown saying to somebody, "Hey, you go into treatment. I'm going to throw you in the South Salt Lake County Jail. If you go into treatment." You can do it. So he's, he or she is forcing these people, and so it's co called coerced treatment. That works. It really does work. And so, and so this thing in Portugal is kind of going the other way and say we're going to decriminalize this and put more treatment services available in the community. We've been trying to do that, and I think we've actually gotten a lot more resources um, in Salt Lake County and, and in Utah because of making the pitch, as Glenn was talking about before. This makes more sense. It makes more sense because if you put a, a mother in the Salt Lake County Jail, and she's got two dependent children, 
So these two kids are taken away from her and they're put into the custody of the Division of Children and Family Services. Cost $24,000 a year for each of those kids to be in DCFS custody. State general fund. It costs 42000 to keep mom locked up for the year. You could put her in treatment with her kids for $24,000 a year. And so when you make that economic argument to legislators, a lot of them listen to it. And then a lot of them also say, hey, this is also the right thing to do. So that's kind of what I would say. Other questions from the audience? Please. Right, and, and when you say drug, when you say uh, there's a, a gap between policy and actual treatment services, and you're exactly right. I think the example that Glenn gave is a perfect example of us clawing back a little bit at that policy. Okay, remember, politicians and policy, the same root word, right? They're no more qualified to be in legislature or in Congress than you are, less probably, <laughs> you know. And they don't know anything at all when you get up there and you have to educate them. And that's why you make those two arguments. And I really do believe we're closing that gap a lot. I think by virtue of the fact that, that, that as one of the 10 essential health benefits in the Affordable Care Act, the behavioral health addictions and mental health services were in there, I think is a big policy stride. What, what about educating physicians? Uh, Dr. Hanson. So just a couple of things. One talking to some of the issues that Peggy raised in this other question as well. Uh, so how does the neurobiology, the medical side, what science has told us about these issues help us in, in resolving or working our way through some of these dilemmas and problems? In terms of the opioid addiction, when I went to dental school in the early 70s, uh, we had the same message that we have now. And I've seen it happen. This is the fourth time I've seen it happen since my career started in uh, dentistry to start off with and then as I moved over into neurobiology and addiction. So it comes, it goes, it comes, it goes, it comes, it goes, it comes, it goes. Usually it's an issue between pain management and drug use. We haven't learned anything new about opioid narcotics from then till now. I mean, we, there's some neurobiology, but we've, we've always known that it can be addicting. We know, we know that it was abused. We knew that it destroyed lives way in the early 70s. I mean, we knew that back in the, the 19th century during, uh, during the Civil War. So we haven't learned anything new in that regard. We know these people jump from the opioids, uh, the prescribed opioids to heroin or other street drugs when we take or we limit their access to the prescription. They're a lot cheaper. Uh, they're easier to get. So there's that dynamic that's always there. And yet we never seem to come up with a way to address this problem. It keeps going and coming, coming and going. And, and to me, that means we're not asking the right questions. So now when I go out on the stump and I tell physicians about this problem, and this has been going on for the last five, six, seven years, what I tell them, and it's not just physicians, it's anyone who prescribes these drugs, I tell them, do you know who the drug dealers are with this drug? I say, it's you. The prescribers. That's where this drug is coming from. And if we want to get a handle on it, we've got to get a handle on you and make sure you're educated, that you're asking the right questions, you're evaluating risk, you're not just prescribing drugs and handing them out. Quick story, uh, about three years ago I had a minor surgical procedure uh, and I, they put me under to do this and I came back and it was an outpatient thing. Uh, Recovered very quickly, had minimal pain with this. I think I used one ibuprofen or something, and that was it. About a year later, I'm in the closet, my uh, clo uh, clothing closet, and I see this drug container, uh, you know, those little bottles you get at uh, the pharmacy. Uh, what is that? I d hadn't really seen that before. And I pull it down, and it's written to me. It was a prescription written for me. It was OxyContin that this surgeon had prescribed and, and I was still a little woozy so he gave it to my wife. She went to the pharmacy and filled it. It was 40 tablets of OxyContin 
been sitting in my closet for the last year. I didn't know it was there. And, and this is a great surgeon. I mean, he did a fantastic job. But he totally failed when it came to dealing with the issue of opioid narcotics. And that is a common, common, common story that is out there. So where... Did you about your question? Did he give you a prescription for OxyContin or OxyContin? It was OxyContin. And it was 10 milligrams or greater? It was 10 milligrams. So that's an error prescribing. You never start an opioid patient with OxyContin. Oh, you're exactly right. I'm a pharmacologist. I'm a neuropharmacologist. That's what I teach the medical students. Good. So, yeah, he, he totally blew it in this regard. But the point is, you've got to educate the ones who are writing the scripts. 80% of this drug is coming from prescriptions. It's not coming from street dealers. It's not coming across the border from Mexico. It's coming from our prescribers. So right off the bat, those people who should know are either ignoring it or they're they're not paying attention so if we can get these folks engaged one of the strategies what we call expert expert stands for screening brief intervention and referral to treatment and that's a, t uh, a program that's targeted to prescribers if we can get them to buy in this to pay attention i guarantee you we'll cut this problem in half and maybe even have a bigger impact than that so, so that, then just the last thing, the, the Puerto Rico phenomena or the Amsterdam phenomena or now the Colorado, uh, Oregon, Washington phenomena or California, what are we learning as, as populations are liberalizing their attitudes towards these drugs and what it is that we do with the drugs? Well, we don't know, quite honestly. I mean, we never know what the statistics are, represent. When we go to a foreign country like Puerto Rico and they said, look, our use rate hasn't gone up, our abuse rate hasn't gone up, that could just mean we've changed our definitions as to what that is. It can also mean that they don't have the means to gather the data. It can also mean that my biggest concern when we trivialize legalization or we look at the criminal justice side, because I'm totally on, let's don't put them in jail, let's treat them. I have no problems with trying to educate that side of the world. But you know where most of our drug addiction uh, epidemics come from? Adolescents. This is where marijuana comes from. It's where alcohol comes from. It's uh, to a large extent where the opioid problems come from. This population already is abusing a drug that's supposed to be illegal. So making something illegal or putting a black box on a legal drug or saying it's illegal for you and that's what all these cultural or institutional or state programs say. Oh, we won't let our youth have this drug because we'll make it illegal for them. And I've, it's already illegal for them. And they're already the major source of early use. So when we, con we converse about this stuff, I've been up talking to the legislatures about marijuana, marijuana legalization, medical marijuana. And my theme is, before you open this Pandora's box, ask the question, what impact will this have on your adolescent population? And until you can answer that, I wouldn't go down that road. Because we know that once you send the message to adolescents that for some reason we're embracing this drug and we're making it part of our culture, whether it was tobacco, it was alcohol, it doesn't matter, or it's marijuana. Once you do that, the use rate in your adolescent population will go up. It absolutely will. It's always done that. It'll always do that. Now the question becomes, what impact will that have? What will it have on the developing brain? And are we willing to address those concerns? We're learning more and more about what marijuana does on the uh, developing brain and IQ and a variety of structures. So we better know what that looks like. And we better know what the use pattern looks like. And guess uh, marijuana today is a lot more potent than marijuana 20, 30 years ago. 
So what will that do? We don't know. We don't have answers to those questions. Are we willing to open the box without knowing what the answer or the consequences of opening that box will be? I mean, we know with tobacco, that is the number one drug in terms of killing people, in terms of costing our culture and our society uh, dollars, and it's legal. So if you want a model for legalizing marijuana, look at tobacco. There's no reason to think that that's going to look much different if people are using it at the same rate that people used to use tobacco. Anyway, okay. I'm getting off so my soapbox. So I'd like to just, um, we're, we're just about out of time, but I'd like to ask uh, Janita and Kristen for any final comments, and then I'm going to turn it over to Joan, because we're supposed to end at 1 o'clock, and she's got a couple of announcements to make. So I'll invite the two of you. So I think um, maybe to address your question a little bit in terms of why we continue to see this gap uh, between where we are from a science standpoint and where we are from a policy standpoint, I'm going to I'm gonna hit back home on my <laughs> challenge around stigma. Um, but I really think that there continues to be this mentality um, in the general population and particularly among policymakers about sort of um, addiction as a moral failure or as something that could never happen to me um, because I would never make a bad choice. Uh, and there is absolutely nothing that distinguishes me from any other addict other than the fact that I have a support system and I had a bunch of things in place in my life um, that kind of enabled me to get here. Uh, it has nothing to do with my brain chemistry or anything like that and in fact you know it's the exact opposite um, and so I think this one of our therapists asked this question of individuals that we hire and she asked what do you think contributes to someone being homeless and I think the reality of that is that there are so many things, but it could literally happen to any of us. And so I'll just throw my own personal story onto this, which is, you know, about a year ago, or 13 months ago exactly, I had a baby, my second baby. And um, it was a really long delivery and I had a C-section. Um, and so I came home with lots of drugs to make me feel better and be able to move around. And I had all of the other kind of complicating factors associated with having a baby and I had some depression associated with that. And at one point I found myself being like, oh, I really want some of those drugs. Like I want, I want the drug because it's gonna help me feel better and I'm gonna sleep and I won't have to think about all of the stress in my life. And because I work in the field that I work in and because I have really supportive parents and a really supportive husband, I was able to say, you need to get those things out of the house. <laughs> um, they need to go and I need to taper. Um, but that was it. That was all it was. It was having a support system in place. And I think until people can start to see themselves in that standpoint, we're just not going to see um, a shift in the way we think about addiction and the way we address it. So I guess I would just go back and kind of getting to Peggy's question is that in my view, um, I, I think it's this issue of turning money away from the criminal justice system and if by decriminalizing substances it allows society to accept that that this isn't a criminal thing anymore and then we can move it into a treatment issue that I think would be beneficial I don't think decriminalizing in and of itself is going to change the likelihood that someone's going to abuse it or not because people abuse for so many reasons and adolescents for their own unique set of reasons and so on and so you know I I would be for it from from the standpoint of if it would allow us as a society to move beyond this idea that this is a moral issue or an issue of will and allow us to not have to have people go through the criminal justice system. I mean, I have a story, I have a, a severely schizophrenic stepson. I've seen this whole thing. I can't get him treatment unless he goes through the criminal justice system. And it is absurd. And he's going to lose his housing because he used, abuses substances to treat his mental illness. It's insane, right? I mean, that's the definition of insanity, is that they have to go through the criminal justice system system in order to get adequate treatment for what is a medical issue.
Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> and I promise I will only one minute. Just want to take my name is Joan Gregory and I'm here from Technical Sciences Library. And um, we wouldn't be here all together uh, without uh, the National Library of Medicine, which is the organization that created um, the exhibit that we have right over here. Right here. There's a wonderful exhibit listening to the presentation. Um, and this is part of the exhibit. Ha, 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 ha.